Um, it's lovely to be in Brighton. Not only is it my favourite away day, um, I've always brought my children here uh, to go to the pier and of course the pavilion and fish and chips on the beach. Um, but I also had the pleasure of doing a lot of research here uh, when I was writing the life of Queen Caroline, the unruly queen. And I was visiting in uh, Brighton in uh, conditions not unlike those of today, uh, when the, in the, after the Great Storm, or during the Great Storm, uh, a minaret had um, fallen and made its way through the dome of the music room in the pavilion. So I had been uh, expecting a, a tour of the music room where the Prince Regent uh, held his wonderful concerts. Instead of which, I was sort of looking in at this terrible bit of masonry and what seemed like the destruction of the pavilion uh, all these years after it was um, uh, after it was built. Anyway, um, I was sorry to miss the tour this morning, and I'm hoping to go uh, this afternoon uh, to see one of my very favourite places uh, in England. Uh, one of my very favourite places in America has become Mount Vernon, the Washington's, Georgia Martha Washington's home in Virginia, just outside Washington, D.C. And uh, I have just been touring with my book, um, Georgia Martha Washington, A Revolutionary Marriage. And the question I was asked wherever I went was, why is a Brit writing about America's first power couple? And after I'd answered this question several times, I began, I eventually began my talk by saying, good morning, afternoon, evening. Uh, you'll want to know why a Brit, at which point they uh, all laughed. And the answer is, I went to Mount Vernon in the summer of 2004 when I was uh, promoting my book, Princesses, The Daughters of George III, and was speaking in DC. And I arrived at this national shrine to George Washington and found that it, my immediate thought was, this is so English. And I don't know if any of you have been there, but it is an English manor house uh, when you get to the other side of the English manor house, you see the very wide, majestic Potomac River. And uh, this river does not belong in an English landscape. But my immediate impression that this was a, the home of an English couple stayed with me, even though uh, a thousand American school children would knocking me over as I was trying to uh, make my way through the ruins. Uh, and I read another book, uh, Venus of Empire, The Life of Pauline Bonaparte, but all, all the time in the back of my mind, I was thinking about the Washingtons and reading about George. There wasn't much on Martha. There is, of course, a great deal written on George Washington. And I couldn't find a book about the, the two of them, a, a dual biography. And I wanted to write, eventually, this book, this dual biography. I realized that I wanted to write this dual biography as no one had written it for me to read. And they start in um, 1759, as very British colonial, uh, as two British colonial subjects, Martha is a wealthy 
widow with two children, a wealthy Virginian widow, and George Washington is an impoverished uh, colonial soldier in Virginia. It's a very suitable marriage. And so they marry the year before George III comes to the throne. The story of the next 15 years in which they make Mount Vernon and embellish those rooms with all the best things that, that their tobacco can buy in London um, is one of colonial uh, domestic bliss, um, a marriage of convenience turning, uh, becoming very much what Washington later describes as the most important foundation of life, marriage. And that, um, but, but in that 15 years, they, are, they together are disenchanted with their masters in London and with the British government and ultimately with the king. And when Washington is elected, as he is in Philadelphia in 1775, commander-in-chief of the Continental Army, this ragged gang of militia and people who joined up and never used a musket before. Um, he, uh, one of the reasons uh, he's elected commander-in-chief from among the delegates of all the 13 colonies is people think, well, if Congress can't afford to pay the army, maybe Mr. Washington, who's married to that rich Mrs. Park Custis, maybe he can pay the army. And during the war, the Washington calls for Martha every winter of the war when the campaigning season is finished. And these eight years of the war, in a funny way, they're not only a great success story in the end for the British, for the <laughs> Americans <laughs> and the French, uh, but they are also eight years in which the Washingtons really go through the, a crucible of hell um, and despair. Washington is often despondent, but they come out stronger as a couple than ever. And they retire to Mount Vernon at the end of the war in 1783, hopeful that Washington and can live in retirement at the home he loves, having served Congress um, for long enough, and my God, in terrible, hard enough conditions. But of course, in 1789, when uh, the Electoral College meets in New York, Washington is elected president, um, the first president of the United States, and with him, Martha goes into New York and later to Philadelphia to become the first presidential partner. The term first lady was not a in common use then. So it's not, it's the marriage, it's a 40 year relationship. Washington serves two terms and then they do return to Mount Vernon at last. And in the 40 years, you see the ups and the downs, hideous tragedy. Martha's daughter dies of epilepsy in seven, when she's 17. The Washingtons have no children together, and just after the great American victory of Yorktown in 1781, Martha's remaining child by her first husband, Jackie Park Gustis, dies of camp fever or typhus. But there are grandchildren, and first children in the presidential mansions in New York and Philadelphia are Park Custis' grandchildren. There's much more in this book, and I enjoyed every 
moment of researching and writing it. And um, I hope that some among you will find the time to read it. And uh, I will now return the mic.